Greetings from Michigan State University and welcome to EAB University's Spring 2020 webinar series, which is funded by the USDA Forest Service. This is Robin Usborne and along with my EAB University colleagues, Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University and Amy Stone from Ohio State University, we welcome you to today's webinar entitled, Is This the End of American Beech Trees? Presented by Daniel Volk and David Burke. Let me introduce our presenters today. Dan is the Forest Health Project Coordinator for Cleveland Metro Parks in Ohio. He was brought on with funds from USDA Forest Service to work on beech leaf disease, but he also contributes to other forest health related projects in Cleveland Metro Parks, like Hemlock Woolly Adelgid and Elongate Hemlock Scale. David is a research scientist and vice president for, for science and conservation at Holden Forests and Gardens in Ohio, which includes the Holden Arboretum and the Cleveland Botanical Garden. David received his PhD in biology in 2001 from Rutgers University and holds a master's degree in biology from East Strasburg University. He also has a bachelor's degree in environmental science from Rutgers. His research focuses on the interaction between plants and microorganisms. We're grateful today to have both our presenters to share their expertise with us. To our participants, we welcome your questions and comments. Please type them in the Q&A feature or the chat pod, and we will respond to them after each of the webinar presentations. Tomorrow, you will be emailed a link to a short, voluntary, confidential survey that we hope you will take the time to fill out. It helps us bring these free educational webinars to you. The email will also include our present presenter's contact information, as well as information on how to obtain continuing ed units for viewing this live webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the www.emeraldashborer.info website. Thanks everyone for attending. And Dan, please unmute your mic and begin your presentation. Great, thanks Robin. Yes, so I am Dan Volk with Cleveland Metro Parks and I'll be talking today about beech leaf disease, a little bit about the background and history, symptoms, and then impacts to uh, beech trees. So uh, American beech is a very common tree species on the eastern half of the United States. Not only is it ecologically important as a food resource, but it also provides a really good habitat for wildlife, which is why it's particularly disappointing um, with the emergence of beech leaf disease. So beech leaf disease was first found in Lake County, Ohio in 2012 by John Pogachnik of Lake Metro Parks. And he noticed at a couple of spots that the leaves looked a little odd. They had this banding pattern on them. And as we have continued to look, we have continued to find more beech leaf disease. So what are we looking for here? Um, leaf conditions typically that are found on asymptomatic leaves, um, normal leaves, are simple, they're serrated, uh, very paper thin, and you can see those uh, few cluster, or that cluster on the left of the upper image. Um, and then on the right, we have some mild symptomatic leaves that have uh, a dark intervenal banding pattern there. Uh, but they are typically normal in size and shape. So they're similar to uh, those asymptomatic leaves in regard to size and shape. On, ace, or on more heavily symptomatic, when, when we see a higher severity, we get um, smaller leaves. They're usually curled around the edges. They're very dark uh, and they're thick and leathery in texture as opposed to the paper thin asymptomatic leaves. Typically, you'll start to see these when uh, the banding gets more than two thirds of the leaf. Additionally, we'll see aborted buds as severity increases. And so these aborted buds will stop development, but they'll remain on the stem uh, through July typically. 
uh, at which point they'll become papery thin or papery and um, crumble sort of as you uh, as you go to touch them. And that image at the bottom there is a fallen off bud. This typically leads to uh, more twig and branch dieback and often will lead to reduced canopies overall. And that's what we're seeing in areas that have had beech leaf disease for, for quite some time. So where do we find beech leaf disease when we're looking out in the field? So there's a bottom up perspective that I like to mention, which can be taken twofold. One is that we typically see small shrubs and lower in the lower canopy is where we first find beech leaf disease. So it could be somewhere around eye level or uh, you know just above eye level, but you know up to 10 or 15 feet or so. Secondly, it's really easy to see beech leaf disease as a silhouette from below. So I like to illustrate this with a point um, that I found the first county record in um, Erie County, which is just west of Cleveland. And I was actually on my hands and knees in a beech thicket similar to the picture on the left there. I, I was pretty much crawling on my hands and knees uh, looking up into the canopy. Uh, and I found about 10 or so leaves, so not very many, that were right at eye level. And I would have certainly missed them had I not been looking into that lower canopy and looking for that silhouette from below. So that's really important when you're out looking for these initial symptoms. So the funding that was provided from USDA Forest Service through the Emerging Pest and Pathogen Pot uh, was provided to Cleveland Metro Parks to coordinate three different aspects of the project and, and bring me on to really coordinate these. So first, we wanted to coordinate national survey efforts. Uh, we'll also talk a bit about the seasonal symptom progression. And number three there, I won't mention today because we are um, not quite far along enough to share any informative data, but I will mention that between the United States and Ontario, we've established over 50 monitoring plots and we'll uh, start to assess the data there uh, from those plots soon. So going back to number one, uh, looking at the national survey efforts, we wanted to use um, Tree Health Survey, and I'll mention that in a minute as well as our data collection tool. So how do we collect the data? Um, when I was first brought on in 2018, we received over 12 different types of data so from different sources. Some of it as simple as an email, a phone call, a text even, and sometimes even paper records. Um, some of the more structured data sources we got were Excel files, um, shape files, or you know, Google Earth layers. But really, it made it very difficult to compile all this information and report out efficiently. So we developed a standardized set of questions, uh, which adequately captured the, the description of beach leaf disease or other symptoms that you were seeing, your location, and some degree of severity. Um, we also highly encouraged pictures to verify some of this information. So we rolled that out and, and provided all those questions to state and local partners, really just emphasizing to get out and start looking uh, really widespread, you know, as, as much as we could. So we did that using Tree Health Survey, which is an app we developed specifically for beech leaf disease data collection. Um, now, some states already had uh, data collection protocols in place, and that's quite all right to use those. Uh, but for some states that didn't have access to those or other local partners um, that didn't have those, those same resources, we provided Tree Health Survey as a way to um, you know, standardize our data collection and really maximize our efficiency so that we can report out any new findings, any new county records, uh, or anything really interesting for, for beech leaf disease. So this is a quick view within our app. Um, you've got several questions listed out here. And as you click on it, you can get not only a picture that describes the symptoms, um, but you can also get a description of what you're looking at. 
And so this can be useful, especially for citizen scientists that may not even be familiar with what a beech tree is. So we actually provide a tutorial and give some background information so that anyone can contribute to uh, this study. And what we really emphasize is taking pictures uh, and those pictures and all the records that are associated with that observation are sent directly to me so that I can confirm um, what we're looking at there and make sure that it's not some sort of you know, herbicide or other insect damage that's occurring. So originally this uh, app, the Tree Health Survey app, was available only for Apple devices and required a constant data connection to submit. Um, so we've actually received additional emerging pest and pathogen funding this past year uh, to upgrade the, the app and provide some really useful tools. So through Kent State University, we're developing the app to allow for data collection offline in remote rural areas. Uh, we're also creating an Android version and we're going to have a map feature that not only allows you to see where your points are, but you can also see where others uh, have taken data. And so if you've got any questions on how to contribute to the survey, or if you have a, you know, a, a protocol, a method in place already for your state, and you want to conform to the same questions in the same format, then please, uh, I'm including my email again there so that you can reach out directly to me. And this is the product of our first year, the 2018 data, where we had 24 counties collected. Uh, and, and again, this is from more than 12 different sources of data. So difficult to put together, um, but fast forward one year and we've now got 41 counties that are positive for beech leaf disease. And I will add one caveat there that West Virginia um, you notice the uh, white bars going across. That is only to indicate nematode DNA only and no leaf symptoms or live nematodes were found there. And uh, David will be talking shortly uh, about his nematode work. So, um, but really what we see is a lot more counties have been found to be positive here. And part of the question is, are we searching in the right areas, are we searching enough, or is this true beech leaf disease spread? Um, and that's really why it, it comes in handy to show where these records ha have been taken. And so this is information from the Tree Health Survey app. So we had over 600 data points in Ohio, which is amazing. Um, and we've collected a lot of information. You can even see the color coding there uh, for severity of beech leaf disease. So the darker green, the more severe the symptoms are. And we do have some dead trees that are uh, black dots there. So we have lots of data in Northeast Ohio and uh, it starts to get a little bit sparse as we move out of the populated area in Northeast Ohio. So what I really wanna emphasize is that we need to focus not only in Ohio, uh, but across the range of beech leaf disease, we need to get boots on the ground and get people looking in these areas that are on the edge of the range of beech leaf disease. And so not only are they more at risk for having beech leaf disease, but we really don't have a lot of data points in those areas. So we don't know what's going on. And that'll be our goal for, for 2020 this year. So moving on to our second project, which is to look at seasonal symptom progression. We noticed a couple of things when we first started looking at beech leaf disease. Uh, first being that we can have a variety of symptoms all on the same branch. Um, when looking at some of these leaves here, like the cluster of leaves that says leaf condition one, asymptomatic with the arrow pointing towards it, those all emerge from the same bud. To the right of that, we have leaf condition three or heavy symptoms that also emerge from the same bud. So we're seeing leaves that are emerging from the same bud that typically have very similar symptoms to one another. We also noticed early on in spring when leaves were just beginning to emerge 
that we could see symptoms on those young leaves. Sometimes you have to kind of pull them apart like, like an accordion um, without them ripping, uh, but they're, they're present. But what we didn't do is track them through time to see if um, asymptomatic leaves become symptomatic during the season, or if we see mild symptomatic leaves that become heavy or, or develop more bands throughout the season. So what we did was actually track four candidate trees in early spring of last year, and I visited those uh, exact same branches every two weeks approximately. Uh, we were able to look at 74 leaves from four trees uh, with one branch from each tree. I'll first start off on the lightly infected tree here. Um, this was one of the healthiest trees in, of the four that we had. Um, leaves started emerging mid to late May, uh, and this image here captures them at full size. Uh, we see all 18 leaves are asymptomatic. And if we fast forward to the end of the season, we still have 18 leaves, all of which are asymptomatic. Um, that's good. We're, we're not seeing any development of symptoms throughout the season. And we have all of the same leaves that we started with. Um, and beech tend to hold their leaves a little bit later in the season than some trees. So they can last through late October, sometimes early November. And we use that as our cutoff to say um, whether or not we were having early leaf drop. Now on the opposite side of the spectrum, this is a very heavily infected tree. This is May 30th when we are really starting to see the full size of the leaves, but they did emerge just a few weeks prior. Uh, we can see that all of the symptoms are very present immediately upon leaf out. Leaves one and two are mild and have some banding there, but um, leaves three through nine are heavily symptomatic. They are very dark, they're curled, um, they're not that normal shape, they have a thickened leathery texture, and some of them even have necrotic tissue already uh, early in the season. Two other things I want to point out is there's one aborted bud at the terminal end of that twig there, and that leaf number four has already been lost within the first few weeks of the season. So that's really uh, striking to me. If we fast forward to mid-season in August, uh, we've already lost five leaves, and we have significant necrotic tissue developing on leaf number three there. Um, those two heavy leaves, uh, three and eight, were lost uh, within the next month or so. And the only ones that really remain throughout the, the entire season are, are those mild leaves, one and two. Now, another thing to point out is there is some bit of yellowing which appears, um, and it doesn't always appear on, on leaves, but if it does, it tends to happen later in the season. And there's only a few bands that, that have that yellowing uh, on, this, on these leaves. Um, another thing, if I back up just one slide, you can see the number of bands that are present don't change throughout the season. So if you um, look at leaves one and two, uh, they really haven't changed. There hasn't been an expansion of, of bands or an addition of bands of any kind. And just to give the, the full picture here, uh, all of our asymptomatic leaves remain on the trees through October, sometimes into November, and uh, none of them became symptomatic throughout the season. Our mild symptom leaves, we only had one that was lost from tree three that was between May and June, but other than that, they mostly remained on the branches, again, through normal senescence time in you know, late October, early November. And finally, our heavy symptom leaves. You can see that we are losing leaves very early in the season, and that continues on uh, through July, August, September, uh, and even into October, well before normal leaf senescence occurs. So overall, we found that yes, symptoms are obvious at leaf emergence and that both asymptomatic and mild symptomatic leaves don't have any band development over the growing season. 
So if a leaf emerges asymptomatic, it remains asymptomatic. Or if it emerges with three bands, it continues to persist with only those three bands. The striking part here is that the heavy symptomatic leaves developed necrotic tissue and a lot of them dropped off really early in the season, sometimes as early as June, whereas we didn't have any early leaf drop on healthy leaves. So now I wanna to turn to focus on some of the projects we've been doing at Cleveland Metro Parks. So Cleveland Metro Parks is one of the oldest park systems in the country. We were established in 1917 and we have over 24,000 acres across 18 reservations. So beech leaf disease was first found in 2012 in our neighboring county of uh, Lake County. And we found it in Cuyahoga County in our North Chagrin Reservation and South Chagrin Reservation um, in 2014. Now, because we have plots set up all around Cleveland Metro Parks, we were able to establish an annual tree condition survey. We selected 13 plots in 2015, and we have been going to those plots every year um, since 2015. And we initially categorized them as low, medium, or high severity. Um, and since then, we've, we've tweaked it just a little bit, and we actually have the percentage of the canopy that's affected with each leaf symptom. So we've targeted about 20 trees per plot, leading to 302 trees that we've individually tracked over time. Most of them were, were relatively small at seven centimeters, but we, we do have some large mature beech at uh, 72 centimeters. And what we can see from that is if we look at the asymptomatic or normal leaf cover, um, we're seeing that over time that asymptomatic leaf cover is going down and we're also including canopy dieback in that as well so we're seeing some canopy dieback and we're also seeing an increase in mild and heavy symptom leaves if we split this out and we look at trees by their size we split it into four size classes um, seedlings and saplings are most heavily affected by beech leaf disease. So you can see in year zero, the first year of detection, um, that most of the trees, um, seedlings, saplings, trees, they're all, you know, over 75%. So they're all relatively healthy. Um, we go into year one, uh, not too much of a change, but between year one and two, we start to see that decline for seedlings. And the same can, can be said for saplings as well. Now, year four and year five is where we start to see a lot of heavy decline in, in those smaller size classes. And the same is also then true for trees. Um, not much of a change in trees between years two and three, but we're seeing a lot of decline in year three, four, and five for, for all of these size classes. Now, looking at the large trees that are over eight inches in diameter, um, they are tending to, to hold on a little bit longer and do a little, a little better than some of their smaller uh, saplings and seedlings nearby. Um, there's not much of a decline through the first three years of having beech leaf disease, and we do see a bit of a decline in years four and five. Part of that is again from an increase in both mild and heavy symptoms, but also uh, just a decline in canopy overall. And so I just wanna share a couple of other topics that, that we don't have time to discuss today. Um, we at Cleveland Metro Parks have been able to track spread across the landscape uh, through our, our county. Um, from 2014 to 2017. And that was because we've had plots that have been established uh, well before beech leaf disease. And we know that we were out looking and, and haven't found it in those, uh, those individual plots. And so we can actually track the spread as we were able to come across it and find it uh, from 2014 to 2017. We also have some preliminary treatment ex uh, experiments with Davy tree and Bartlett. 
um, <clears throat> looking at different aspects, um, whether being preventative uh, beech leaf disease treatment or treatment of trees with symptoms. And then there's various diagnostic labs that are doing work. Uh, David will be talking in a minute here. Uh, but there are several other groups that are doing diagnostic work as well. And all of these three topics, as well as some of the stuff I've already discussed today, were presented by uh, Dr. Constance Hosman through the uh, Natural Areas Association webinar. So you can go to their website or you can just search in YouTube, is this the end game for beech trees? And there's a link there as well. And so. Uh, she does a great job of, of summarizing some of that work that I just mentioned. And then lastly, I just want to share the link for the ODNR um, forestry page, which shares the uh, pest alert that we have, and it has a, a map, a PDF version of the map as well. So I've shared that information here, but you can get a little bit more um, comprehensive information and uh, in a shareable PDF. So with that, I just wanna thank the funding sources through the Forest Service and Cleveland Metro Parks, as well as our support um, through field work from LEAP, the Lake Erie Allegheny Partnership, um, who have done a wonderful job, a lot of local conservation organizations, um, and uh, the ODNR Division of Forestry, again, a lot of work on the ground, getting surveys throughout Ohio, uh, Kent State University for their work on the app development through Tree Health Survey, and then Ontario, who has been uh, a good collaborative uh, working group as well. And so with that, uh, I am going to open up to a few questions. All right, thank you very much, Dan. We have a question here. How long do trees that have been affected last before they are dead? So that is a question that we are still attempting to address. Um, partly it depends on the size. So we are seeing a lot of seedlings um, and saplings that are dying within three, you know, two, three, four years. Um, but it, it's taking longer for some of those larger trees. So maybe pole size. Um, we've seen a, a couple of trees that are, um, you know, five, six, seven, eight inches that, it, that have died um, in Lake County. And so they've had it since 2012. So, you know, that would be seven years or so. Um, it seems the larger the tree, the longer that it's taking to die from, from beech leaf disease. Okay. Um, in older trees, do you see reduction in mast production? Um, that we haven't really quantified um, mass production, we aren't seeing a ton of um, seed crop though, to be honest. Um, a lot of the trees, the beech trees may be sending out the, their root sprouts. So they, they tend to be um, clonal root sprout producing trees. And what we are seeing is that there are a lot of root sprouts that are coming up. So when the, the mature mother tree is stressed, um, you know, she may be sending out those root sprouts rather than uh, seed production as just sort of their, their last ditch effort to, you know, continue to persist. But we haven't really looked at mass production all that much. All right. Um, when do you anticipate the app of being available for Android? So we are, I've got actually a, a testing session uh, this week. And um, we're working through some of the kinks, but it should be available this spring. Um, I would say within the next couple of months, we're gonna, we're gonna hopefully get it out there for, for people to start using. Thank you. Um, is European beech susceptible? Yes, um, there are a few species of beech. European is one of them. Um, and, and David's got some in, in his collection there at Holden Arboretum. Um, and there are some, I don't know if a lot of landscape trees have, have had it, but I do know that they can be affected. And um, are, aren't root sprouts also infected is the question. Yes, yes, they absolutely are. Yeah, we'll, we'll tend to see it. Um, first in the sapling layer or just the lower canopy 
um, and they tend to be, the smaller the tree, the, the more heavy the impacts tend to be, um, and, and usually earlier on. All right. Um, are people aware of European beech leaf weevil in Nova Scotia? Yes, so that's part of the, the working group with Ontario. Um, they are aware of it and we're with the monitoring program, we're, we're starting those discussions about what is Canada going to do with um, the weevil, but also with beech leaf disease uh, and beech bark disease for that matter. Um, so we are aware of it, but how all of these diseases are going to interact is still largely unknown and that's part of what we hope to answer. All right, are these symptoms similar to any other beach specific disease symptoms? Yeah, we have, um, there's a like a leaf curling aphid that um, it will develop it's not quite dark banding, but it's kind of like a crinkled, um, and it kind of looks actually like shattered glass. So it does have a similar type of symptom um, between the, the lateral veins there. Not, um, and you'll also notice that the, leaf's, the, the leaf margin is curled, whereas if it's mild symptoms here, they don't tend to be curled, they tend to be normal shape and size. All right, that looks like all the questions we have at this point. Uh, oh, and I spoke too soon. Are you seeing similar symptoms in root sprouts of an infected host, i.e. parent is similarly severity, there's similar severity in the parent? Uh, no, actually the uh, parent trees tend to be, again, holding on quite a bit longer. They've got a much larger canopy and even in really heavily infested areas, uh, in the lower canopy and the, the sapling layer. If you take binoculars and you look all the way up and that's part of what we're doing for our surveys and our, and our monitoring is we're, we're assessing the entire canopy. Um, and when you look up to the very top, you can actually find a lot of healthy leaves. Maybe not a lot, but, but certainly there's more than would be in the understory in, in the sapling layer. So, yeah, if you if you see saplings that are heavily affected, chances are the the mature parent trees, you can find some healthy leaves up in the very upper portion of the canopy. All right, I think that is the end of the questions at this point. Um, Daniel, if you could um, stop sharing your screen, we'll have David bring his um, screen up, and we'll be, he can begin his presentation. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, we've got right. your screen. Good. And you can hear me okay, right? Yes. Fantastic. So, so Dan has uh, just spoken a lot about um, the symptoms of beech leaf disease and its occurrence. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing here, um, actually looking at the cause of beech leaf disease and what the potential treatments might be. So our work here has also been funded by the Emerging Pest and Pathogen Fund, um, and we've got a number of collaborators, uh, both with U.S. Forest Service, specifically Danielle Martin and Jennifer Cook, who have worked with us on this project. We've also worked extensively with Lynn Carter at the USDA, who's kind of the expert on all things nematode. Um, and we do believe that this disease is being caused primarily by a nematode, and I'll show some of that data and walk you all through uh, how we kind of came to that conclusion. We're also working with Andrew Lloyd at Bartlett Tree Experts, uh, looking at um, pesticides and how pesticides might be able to control beech leaf disease. So uh, thanks to all of our collaborators um, and much of the data I'm showing um, actually comes from them. So um, much of our work on beech leaf disease is actually taking place in a beech bark disease resistance plantation that was set up um, more than 10 years ago. Um, this is a project that Jennifer Cook at the Forest Service piloted um, with some collaboration and help from the Arboretum. So this, this plantation works uh, or lives at the Arboretum. 
The trees are more than 10 years old, probably about 12 years old, so they're relatively large, but it's a very accessible um, place for us to collect samples. When working in the forest, it's very difficult to get leaves out of some of those, those tall canopy trees. So this gives us an opportunity to work with mature trees, but it's very accessible so we can collect leaves and buds. Uh, we can do it frequently, and, uh, and so we can also use this plantation for some pesticide trials where we can inject pesticide into these trees and determine um, the effects on beech leaf disease and some of the nematodes. Um, so we're working a lot in this plantation. We're also um, doing some greenhouse work for some of our nematode trials, which I'll show in a minute. Now we've been using a number of different methods to look at the potential cause of beech leaf disease. We focused a lot on bacteria and fungal pathogens, and that's kind of where we began. But we've also been looking at the possibility of nematodes. And this is based on some really early reports from David McCann of Ohio State University who found nematodes on leaves affected by beech leaf disease. So we've been collecting both symptomatic and asymptomatic leaves and buds from our plantation. And as Dan showed a few minutes ago, you can have both symptomatic and asymptomatic leaves um, on the same branch on the same tree. And so we've been collecting um, both of the uh, asymptomatic leaves and adjoining buds and symptomatic leaves and adjoining buds from these trees in the plantation to determine differences in fungal bacterial communities in the hopes of finding a potential pathogen that could, could be causing beech leaf disease. But again, also looking at um, these nematodes and using um, both some DNA methods, um, including sequencing so we can identify bacteria and fungal taxa, um, and also to try to identify this nematode, as you can kind of see wiggling there underneath our microscope. So we're able to actually do live nematode extractions. We can use them for some inoculation work but we can also uh, use those live extractions to get us a sense as to how these populations are changing over the course of the year. Now I'm gonna start with some of the least interesting data first and move to the more interesting data. So um, this is an analysis of fungal communities on leaves and buds. And this is, this is a, an ordination technique that we use to look at the similarities between communities. So basically if two points are similar, close together in space, then they have very similar communities. Um, if they're far apart, then they have very different communities. And what you can see here is you can see the, the symbols on the upper left there, those squares represent leaves, and the green symbols represents the asymptomatic leaves, and the red symbols represent the symptomatic leaves. So, so those are leaves there on the upper left, and on the lower right there, you've got buds represented by those uh, circles, also green being uh, asymptomatic and red being symptomatic tissue. So what we can see here is that these, these fungal communities on leaves and buds, um, regardless of whether they're, they're affected by beech leaf disease, they have very similar, similar fungal communities. So this is suggesting to us that there's probably not a fungus or a fungal pathogen that's involved with beech leaf disease since the communities on affected and unaffected tissue are the same. But we do see some differences between leaves and buds. So we've done some sequencing here to try to identify those differences in the communities and what we find on the buds there on the, the upper part of the, the graph is that they, they tend to have a lot of, um, of sequences uh, in the genus Tephrina. And Tephrina is a, a potential pathogen on um, members in the genus Prunus. It causes peach leaf curl, but it's not known to cause um, any types of diseases on, on beech trees. Um, so, so we do have some potential pathogens there, but we don't think they're the cause of beech leaf disease. Um, we also have some potential um, uh, leaf spot uh, pathogens, Ramularia there on the lower part, um, we find on the leaves of, of many of these trees, but again, not really associated with beech leaf disease per se. We tend to find it um, throughout the plantation, throughout the, the leaves we've collected. So this gives some idea as to the types of um, uh, conditions of leaves that we see within our plantation. As Dan was noting, uh, there's differences in, in the degree of beech leaf disease, uh, even on a particular branch. We see many of these different types of conditions on the leaves. Those leaves there on the lower left have uh, sort of a round um, leaf spot, which, which could be coming from a fungal pathogen. But when we look at beech leaf disease, these are, th these are the leaves that we're really interested in. These are the leaves that are really thickened and leathery and somewhat malformed. And these are also the leaves that we find nematodes in. None of the rest of those leaves actually contain nematodes, just that group there on the upper left. And so, so again, suggesting to us that maybe nematodes are in fact um, associated or are causing beech leaf disease. Now we've done some similar types of work with bacterial communities and we have a slightly different result. There on the left, 
we see the bud communities. And so we see that there are really no differences in the bacterial communities between buds that are associated with symptomatic or asymptomatic tissue. But there on the right, we see there's some differences in the bacterial communities on leaves, um, depending upon whether they have beech leaf disease or not. And so, so beech leaf disease, um, we do see differences in the bacterial communities on those leaves, um, depending upon whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic. So there's a po potential role, a possible role, for, for bacteria um, in beech leaf disease. But when we look at our sequencing analysis, what we see here, you see the asymptomatic leaves on the top and the symptomatic leaves on the bottom. What we see primarily in terms of differences are these groups here with the arrows. So especially that group over there on the far right, Wolbachia. So this is a bacterial group that's known to be an endosymbiont of insects, arthropods, um, as well as some nematodes. And so there are some nematodes that will contain Wolbachia as an endosymbiont. So the large um, number of, of uh, clones in that library, and they're absent in, in libraries with asymptomatic leaves, we only find these in, in the libraries of symptomatic leaves. Those, those large numbers suggest to us that either the Wolbachia is uh, present in the nematodes themselves, or it might be indicator of a vector of the nematodes, maybe an arthropod, an insect, that could be carrying the nematodes from tree to tree. Um, so we don't feel as though a bacteria is really causing beech leaf disease. We think there may be some association with bacteria and beech leaf disease, um, but we think, uh, based upon this analysis, we don't really see any bacterial pathogens associated with symptomatic leaves, but we see some, some groups that are interesting in terms of how they may be associated with a nematode or a potential vector of a nematode. So we have been looking at the nematode. Um, we can uh, extract uh, nematodes um, from, uh, from the tissue, live nematodes. Um, and we've done some sequence analysis and the, the nematode we're finding is actually um, Litolancus crinate. So, so this is a nematode that was identified um, really about two years ago. Um, from, from beach in Japan. So it was found on Japanese beach. And it was a Japanese group that identified um, this as really a new species at that point. So, um, so we think that this is a, the, the, the organism that's on these, these leaves and a recent paper that's been accepted um, in forest pathology that Lynn Carter piloted is suggesting that this may be a new subspecies, which is be, being called uh, Litolancus crinidae mccanii um, after Dave McCain um, at Ohio State. So, we believe that this nematode um, is, is causing the likely cause of beech leaf disease. And I'll show you um, why we've done that. We've done some work to try to close Cook's postulates, um, but also the detection of the nematode tends to increase with the severity of beech leaf disease. So there on the top panel, you can see that as the severity of the disease increases on these trees, going from sort of lightly affected to heavily affected, the percentage of tissue that we can detect nematodes on increases from about you know, 45% to about 90%. Um, and we can detect the nematodes both, as you see there on the lower panel, on symptomatic and asymptomatic leaves, for example. We tend to find much higher levels of the um, nematode. We, we tend to find much uh, larger numbers of, of the buds affected by nematode than, than leaves um, during our sampling, which was October of 2017. So, so what we're seeing there is we're seeing a much higher levels or much greater detection of nematodes in the buds, and, and that'll become uh, clear in a few minutes. We think, we think that the nematodes are actually overwintering in the buds, and they, will, they move from the leaves in the fall um, into the bud tissue. And so we think that that's one of the reasons why we're seeing much higher levels or de greater detection of nematodes in the buds um, at that time of year. Now we've also been looking at populations of these nematodes. So we've been using this water extraction method. So we can um, bear them in funnel basically to get, have the nematodes kind of crawl out of the leaf tissue and then we can, um, we can separate them and we can count them underneath the microscope. And so this is showing the total number of live nematodes per gram of leaf tissue for two years. We began this in um, sort of early July, uh, late June of 2018. Um, and went through the end of the growing season. And we began again um, in 2019 with this work. And what you can see is that the numbers tend to be fairly low throughout much of the season. We have maybe about 100 nematodes per gram of leaf tissue through much of the year. But then the numbers tend to spike um, in late October. And, and even though this is two separate years, they were really consistent in terms of when those numbers started to peak, the 31st of October in 2018 and the 29th of October in 2019. 
And so um, we believe that this is because the nematodes, as their population begins to expand at that point, are leaving the leaves and they're actually entering the buds and they overwinter in the buds. And they can cause damage in the buds um, over that period of time. So as those leaves begin to leaf out in the spring, the beech leaf disease symptoms are already apparent and obvious. So we've done some um, bud inoculation and leaf inoculation work, as I said, to try to close Cook's postulates and see if inoculating these nematodes onto um, uh, trees that, that have no signs of beech leaf disease in the greenhouse could initiate symptoms. And so what we've done is we've, we've done this um, both with uh, dormant buds. Um, we've done this twice. We've done this in October of, of 2018. That was the first trial where we inoculated uh, both dormant buds and also leaves of, of healthy trees that have been kept in stole, cold storage and leafed out late in the year. So we we're able to inoculate the whole leaves as well. And then we did this again with dormant buds um, in April of 2019, again with trees that had gone through the, the dormancy period in the greenhouse and were, had no signs of beech leaf disease. And so uh, we've done these inoculation work twice. Now on the left there you see one of the leaves that we uh, typically inoculated. We surrounded it with a chem wipe to keep it damp, um, placed in a plastic bag also so it stays damp to give the nematode an opportunity to enter. We haven't seen any, um, any signs of uh, beech leaf disease on those leaf inoculations. They went for five months after nematode inoculation and we saw, we saw no uh, evidence of, of beech leaf disease on those leaves. But the buds is a different story. The bud there on the right was, was uh, inoculated in, um, uh, in the spring of this year and um, what I'll show you here now is the results of those bud inoculations. So on the left, um, that's what the leaves look like after they, they leaf out when they've been inoculated with the nematodes. So they, they were inoculated in October of 2018 and then um, in the spring they leafed out. And where we applied nematodes, we have that dark banding that is characteristic of beech leaf disease. Um, on the right there is a plant that we uh, inoculated in the greenhouse in the spring of, of 2019 and about two weeks later those those buds opened up and also um, have beech leaf disease. So you can see some of that dark inter intervenal banding there, though it's not quite as distinctive as the picture on the left. So we believe that the nematode is required for beech leaf disease. Inoculating these dormant buds um, with the nematodes collected from the field um, does result in the development of beech leaf disease uh, symptoms. And, and these, these, these buds obviously the, the damage is taking place in the bud so that as the buds open um, and the leaves unfurl, you can already see um, the beech leaf disease uh, symptoms there. So um, to kind of show a little bit more about what this nematode does and looks like, these are, this is a bud that was collected from our lower Baldwin um, plantation, that, that beech bark disease resistance plantation that we've been working in. And you can see the hole on the bottom there. These buds uh, were sent to, to Lynn Carter at the USDA and her and her collaborators were able to use scanning electron microscopy uh, to sort of look inside um, these buds uh, and try to detect the nematode. And so this is the result of, these are some of those images that they developed. Um, so you can see uh, both there uh, on the left and also there on the upper right, what these nematodes look like in the dormant buds. So they are, they are present in the dormant buds in spring. Um, like I said, I believe we believe that they're overwintering and also causing damage uh, in those buds uh, during that, that period of, of, of time, uh, either, either late in the fall or early in the spring, but they're, they're causing some of this damage um, in, the, in the bud itself. These are also some scanning electron microscope uh, pictures of on the left what a healthy leaf looks like without beech leaf disease. And so you can see the palisade layer and the mesophyll there. They look very happy, very, very nice looking leaf. There on the lower right, um, you can see a, a, a leaf with beech leaf disease. And so it looks a little bit like a grenade went off inside that, that mesophyll tissue. Um, it's disorganized, obviously it's damaged severely. And when you, when you kind of zoom in on it, you can actually see some of the nematodes in that damaged tissue. And it's a little bit hard to see here if you squint you can see some of those nematodes, but this is sort of a false color image of what uh, the nematode looks like within some of that damaged mesophyll tissue. So again, we think that the nematode is required for beech leaf disease. It may not be sufficient. There may be a bacterial component um, to this as well, where bacteria may be acting as secondary pathogens, or they could be um, working in tandem with the nematode to cause the damage that we're seeing. Um, but we do believe that the nematode is required for beech leaf disease. And without the nematode, um, you would not have beech leaf disease. 
So some of our work now is moving on to potential vectors. We think that once the nematode is present within the tree, it can maintain itself within the tree by moving from the leaves to the buds uh, in October. And so it can colonize those buds and overwinter. The question becomes, how is it moving regionally? How is it moving from tree to tree or forest to forest? So some of the work has focused in on um, birds as potential vectors. Some birds will eat beech buds. And so it's possible that as they, if they eat infected buds, as they defecate, some of those eggs can come out and, call and, and basically affect uh, a new tree. It's also possible that, that um, insects, especially mites, might be carrying these nematodes about. Like I said earlier, we do find um, that bacterial group Wolbachia present on symptomatic leaves. They are known to be um, uh, insect endosymbionts. And so it may be that they're an indicator of, of vector of, of uh, this nematode. And so this is a, another short video of a mite that Lynn Carter and Ron Ochoa collected here at Holden. And if you look closely um, as this video plays, you'll be able to see the, the mite sort of moving around. You can see its legs there on the left, and uh, you'll see a nematode kind of stick its little head out there. Um, so these nematodes are entrained um, within the mites on their legs. Um, and so we think that these, there it comes out right there. Um, we think that these nematodes um, are potentially being carried um, by mites, um, and that could be how it's spreading from forest to forest and throughout the region. Now we've worked with Bartlett tree a little bit as well, looking at potential control, focusing on the nematode. And so we're using or looking at emibectin benzoate products. Um, and so this is the result, a preliminary result um, from some of the data Andrew Lloyd collect, uh, collected uh, at our plantation. So the trees there were injected um, with these products in the fall of 2018. Um, and then collected, these leaves were collected in 2019 to look for the presence of the nematode. And so both of those products there, triage G4 and triage R10, um, both had significant, reduced nematode um, presence significantly um, in those trees. And I think the difference between those two products is the uh, percent of active ingredient. So I think G4 has about 4% active ingredient, and I believe R10 has about 8% active ingredient. So when injecting um, trees in the field, um, we, we can see a reduction in the nematodes, the number of nematodes um, on these trees. So it suggests that um, these products could be useful for treating landscape um, specimens um, that might be affected by beech leaf disease in the nematode. And again, some data from Andrew um, at, at Bartlett Tree Experts looking at um, emibectin uh, benzoate um, in, in vitro. So um, can, can this product uh, in, in the laboratory um, increase mortality of the nematode, and in fact it can. So as you can see there um, from those upper bars, mortality increases dramatically to about 80%, 100% in some of these treatments. And so it indicates that um, even in the laboratory, emibectin benzoate can, uh, can kill these nematodes. And so this might be an effective control measure for beech leaf disease, at least for landscape specimens. And so we're beginning to do some new pesticide trials in our greenhouse. We're looking at the protect, protective effects of these pesticides. So we've injected some of our trees last fall um, and our plan is to inoculate them with uh, live nematodes within the next couple of weeks um, and, and see uh, if, if uh, emamectin benzoate can actually uh, prevent um, uh, beech leaf disease and, and nematode colonization. And uh, just in summary, uh, beech leaf disease we think is caused by the nematode, little Lancus crinidae, which is from the Pacific Rim. Um, it, it can cause all of these symptoms that, that Dan was showing in his presentation a little bit earlier. Um, the population dynamics, it, it appears as though they tend to really peak in terms of population size um, in late uh, autumn. Uh, and we think that that's because they're moving into the buds where they overwinter uh, for, the, for the season. And uh, it appears as though emibactin benzoate might be able to reduce nematode numbers even in, in field, uh, field trees and that could be a possible control mechanism. So again, uh, there could be a, a potential bacterial component to beech leaf disease, um, but we believe that this nematode is required for beech leaf disease. Without it, um, we would not have beech leaf disease. So little Lancus crinata is, is, is the, the causative agent of beech leaf disease primarily. And with that, I just wanna thank my collaborators again, Jennifer Cook and Daniel Martin at the Forest Service, Lynn Carter uh, at the USDA, uh, Andrew Lloyd at Bartlett Tree, and uh, my uh, my collaborators here at Holden Arboretum, Adam Hoke and Sarah Kiker, who also contribute a lot to the, to the research that I showed. And I think I can take uh, any questions that folks might have. Well, thank you, David. Um, we do have a question. 
is nematode movement from leaf to bud in fall done externally and or internally? We think it's done externally. So we think that they're moving on um, sort of a water film. Many of these foliar nematodes require a water film to be able to move and colonize new tissue. So in some ways, uh, the, the autumn is a good time to do that. We have a lot of very dewy mornings. So um, a lot of the leaves and, and, and the tissue tends to be wet. So we think that they're able to move that way. We've started to do some work in our greenhouse here. Where those, those trees that we inoculated with nematodes and that developed beech leaf um, symptoms, we, we have two groups. One group that we just continued to pot water where the leaves were not wet at all. So the nematode, that should prevent the nematode from moving into the buds. And then another group where we actually were misting those leaves throughout the fall. So if those nematodes uh, can move and move into the buds, they'd have an opportunity to do that there. So we're kind of testing that a little bit experimentally now, but we think that they're moving um, externally on that water film. All right. Um, are there any known symptoms of BLD in the Pacific Rim? So the Japanese beach that were, um, that were examined uh, initially a couple of years ago, they, they have a similar but different pattern. So they have um, what they refer to as galls. It's sort of really an intervenal yellowing of the tissue. Um, so it doesn't really look like a traditional gall, but it's sort of inter intervenal yellowing that, that, that happens. What we're seeing is more of this intervenal darkening, but later in the fall, many of those leaves will develop that sort of intervenal yellowing as well. So, so the, the pattern of, of um, symptoms there was different, um, but, but similar in some respects. All right, how far are nematodes moving within one tree? Well, we're not sure. We, th we think that the nematodes, uh, they're obviously quite small. So we think that they're probably moving from the bud uh, or from the leaf, I should say, into the adjacent dormant bud. Now, it's also possible that as rain falls, if those, those nematodes are on the outside of those leaves as they're moving, as that rain falls, it could wash them off onto other leaves uh, lower in the canopy. So, so how far they can move would depend upon those conditions in terms of, you know, sort of independent movement, they're probably going from those leaves into the buds for sure, um, but it's possible that um, rainfall or, or, or water um, moving through the canopy could also wash them off of surfaces and put them onto other surfaces where they can colonize uh, naive tissue. How does nematode cause total disintegration of the mesophyll cells? Does it have a stylet or a chewing mouth part? I believe it has a chewing mouth part, um, but it's, it's feeding within that mesophyll tissue. Can you detect nematodes from bud tissue in winter or early spring? Yes, so we can, we can collect uh, bud tissue in winter and we can do extractions and we will, we will be able to get um, live nematodes. We can also do it in spring as well. And we've used those nematodes that we extracted from uh, tissue in March um, to actually do some of those inoculations in the greenhouse. Okay, um, right now, oh, one more question. Hold on just a sec. Could the presence of BLD in root sprouts indicate that the parent tree is already affected and extending to the sprouts from there, meaning internal movement is happening? I, I don't know. Um, our, you know, kind of working ideas that it's um, uh, um, not really moving internally through like the vascular tissue, but it's actually moving externally from the leaves to the buds. And so those root sprouts, um, if the, the adult tree, um, the parent tree is affected as, as rainfall washes through the canopy, it's possible that some of those nematodes could then wash onto those root sprouts. The root sprouts are probably at sort of greater risk of uh, infection or uh, or disease progression because uh, the nematodes probably prefer it a little dark and damp. And so many of the trees that we see at our plantation, at least at first glance on the outside, you don't see a lot of beech leaf disease on the outer branches and leaves. But when you get up to the tree and you look, you see that the interior is very, very often heavily colonized and infected. So um, it may be that uh, the degree of light, the degree of, of moisture and dampness 
um, contributes to the success of the nematode. And so the understory plants are, are, are the understory trees, whether they be root sprouts or saplings, they seem to be very heavily impacted, um, probably because of the, 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 you know, the damper, um, somewhat darker conditions that you get in the, the, the subcanopy and the understory. All right, is, um, is it in Indiana? I don't believe we've det detected it in Indiana. So um, referring to sort of Dan's map there, um, we haven't um, detected it um, in Indiana, at least on, we have collect, we have had samples sent to us from a number of different locations um, where the Forest Service has uh, beach plantations. We haven't detected anything from Indiana. Okay, I have a question. I think this is a question or maybe it's a comment from Faith Campbell. It says detection has been done by amateurs in Connecticut. So uh, I'm sure yeah, so I'm not sure how the detection in Connecticut was determined. Um, we've, we've collected samples. The West Virginia sample that Dan showed on his map was a sample that came to us um, by way of the Forest Service. So uh, we haven't been able to detect live nematodes in those, that sample, that tree, um, but we were able to uh, amplify the, the DNA of the nematode and when we sequenced it. So anything that we do in terms of the, the DNA methods, we, we amplify the DNA and then we sequence it to confirm it. So we were able to confirm that it was Litalancus crinidae from that West Virginia plantation, but it was just the one sample. We were unable to confirm live nematodes there. Um, so we, we've had a number of samples from Pennsylvania, Allegheny National Forest, and, and so they, those samples have nematodes. Um, and we've also collected some samples. We've had some samples sent to us from Michigan so at least one site in Michigan also had, um, we were also able to detect nematodes using these DNA methods. But the Connecticut samples, I'm not sure. Okay, and Faith now says homeowners have contacted her and she puts them in touch with the Connecticut authorities. So, okay. okay. Um, has mortality been seen in the Pacific Rim? Is there natural control? I, I, you know, I'm not sure. I, I, my impression from, um, from some of that work was that it was a problem with, with Japanese beach, but not really resulting in mortality. So um, it may be that it's, it's, it's present within, within those forests, within those trees, but it's not causing um, quite the degree of, of, of symptom severity and problem that's causing here, which is probably you know, not unexpected given that um, it's a potentially invasive pest and um, these trees that we're, we're dealing with here, our American beech are, have not been exposed to it. So they're probably naive and, and suffering um, much greater levels of, of damage as a consequence. Okay, we also I, do see oh. it on European beech as well within our collections, so. Okay, um, uh, uh, Isabel Monks is pathologist from the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station and APHIS experts collected the samples, not amateurs. Okay. okay, Phil Marshall says it's not yet in Indiana and he's surveying. So thank you, Phil. One uh, more time. We've got, I, did, I, you may have answered, what does the nematode life cycle look like? We're not sure yet. So we're still trying to suss that out. We believe that the populations increase, as I showed on that graph, um, in, in late autumn and they move into the buds where they overwinter. We can collect nematode, you know, juvenile nematodes, and we can collect eggs and adults um, late in October into early November from those buds. So, um, and we can do the same thing in early spring. So when we, we do our extractions in spring, we're getting um, nematodes as well as eggs out of those buds. So it seems as though they're overwintering, but I think they're, the details of their life cycle probably still needs to be fleshed out. Okay. Um. I am not seeing any more questions at this point, but I, again, if, uh, if our participants want to ask questions, um, I am going to provide the, in the email, the contact info of both Dan and David. So um, you can shoot them an email after um, this webinar and get some answers from them. And again, thank you so much, um, Dan and David, for this information. It's been very informative and I think from the questions and everything we've got some people who are very much um, you know concerned about this so another great webinar everyone uh, thank you thank you